I am David Scare, and I teach here at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne. And uh, we are getting ready for the sixth Sunday in Epiphany, which <laughs> incidentally falls on the same day as the traditional holiday for the birthday of Abraham Lincoln. And so you might want to play the, the grand... Uh, they, mine eyes have seen the coming of the glory of the Lord, the great, uh, the, the hymn of the Grand Army of the Republic. I'm not sure you want to do it, but our people really like that hymn. I don't know if you want to say, I mean, I don't know if you want to get involved in Abraham, Abraham Lincoln or not. People have forgot it. We are now running through the, um, going through the Sermon on the Mount, which uh, can be said to be the most uh, extensively cruciating section of the New Testament. Um, mentioned last time that uh, there are just too many uh, views and opinions of um, uh, what the meaning of the Sermon on the Mount is. Last time I made note of this book, The Sermon on the Mount Through the Centuries, published by Bravo's Press. And um, so it begins with John Chrysostom, Augustine, you of St. Victor, Dantine, Luther, Calvin, Wesley, Spurgeon, Bonhoeffer, uh, John Paul II, and John Stott. And I'm not saying that's going to add to clarification. I'm not so sure that it will. Uh, but it will indicate that uh, the, the importance that people have seen the Sermon on the Mount, uh, that any preacher or theologian who is worth his salt um, is, is going to have to say something about the Sermon on the Mount and will generally try to twist it to his or her own way of thinking. Uh, it's, uh, I think the, the first thing we have to do is we'll read it in English. I'm using the RSV simply because that's the one I was brought up on. And you can follow along in your English and then we'll make reference to the Greek where we have to do it. We have to remember that the, all of this is, depends upon what Jesus has said in the Beatitudes. So we begin at 521 in Matthew. You have heard that it was said to men of old, you shall not kill. And whoever kills shall be liable to the judgment. But as I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. And whoever assaults his, his brother shall be liable to counsel. And whoever says, you fool, shall be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there is something your brother has against you, Leave your gift there before the altar. Go, first be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Make friends quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out till you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. It is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go to hell. It was said, whoever divorces his wife, let, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of unchastity, makes her an adulteress. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the men of old, you shall not swear falsely but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of Jerusalem, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. A reference to God. And do not swear by your head, 
for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more comes from evil. Well, when you come to this particular section of the Sermon on the Mount of the Gospel of Matthew, you have to be very careful and you have to have your act together. And uh, as, uh, as mentioned uh, on another occasion, and that is I'm not so sure that a 20 or even a 30-minute sermon is going to handle all of this. Um, we have just, uh, in the previous Sunday, it says, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments, and I think Matt, Jesus, as well as Matthew, is uh, referring not to the Mosaic law, but to all the words of Jesus. They all, sort of, they all qualify as commands of God because Jesus himself is God. Now, you have an intensification of the commandments here. Now, this is not really something which is new, and you, I think it, could, it can be said in a sermon, that Jesus comes along and he internalizes the law. What that is, that in the Old Testament, uh, the law it was external. It had to do with the out, outward things that people do and not with the internal existence of an individual. Well, I don't think we really want to entertain that idea because already in the fourth chapter of Genesis, uh, God says to Abraham, not Abraham, excuse me, uh, God says to Cain that sin is lying at the door. It's a great passage. I, I agree with, I follow Luther that it was it was Adam who was the preacher who said to his son Cain that uh, sin was like a mountain lion waiting to whether to take him over. So before he, he murdered the, his brother, he had already, he, because of his hatred in his heart, he had already begun to commit that sin. I really wonder right here, and I think so. Um, I, yes, yes, I think so. In Matthew uh, 20, uh, 21, 22, I, whoever is angry with his brother shall be liable to the, to the judgment. Is this a, a possible reference to, that, to Genesis 4? And is it, is it, wouldn't it be a good idea for the preacher to bring that up in the sermon? as a kind of an illustration of what happens when there, when there is hate. Now, <clears throat> um, when it says, by the way, here, we have to we'll go back to that. Whoever says that, uh, and this is a particularly nasty word, whoever says uh, to his brother, Rekha, whoever says fool, well, you're saying this. You don't know anything. In a, in, a, in a debate in the congregation, one person says to another, you idiot, you do not know anything. Well, according to this, is that, that a person who acts like that is making himself liable for the judgment. And I don't think we're being too severe here. Because... We're going to get in the neck for next Sunday. The, the gospel for next Sunday says, love your enemies and praise up for those who persecute you. That means a Christian cannot enter into judgment with another individual. Now, it's just part of the English language that uh, <clears throat> one person says to another, go to, you know where? Go to Hades, right? Well, that's a curse. You're asking that person to go to hell. That's, that's it. Now, is that kind of a sermon? Is, should that be included in the sermon? Well, I guess that's up, that's up to each preacher. However, if, you, if you've made that point, you can be assured that people will listen. They will not tune out on that one. And, of course, this is going to be the problem that, that comes up, by the way, that uh, maybe God forgives you, but I don't forgive you. 
the, the lack, this is going to be a pericope, I love this pericope, by the way, because it has to do with reconciliation. Because in verse 21, it says, uh, verse 23, before you lay your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something, I'm going to take a look at this in the Greek here, by the way, because it is, it is, it is significant and it is important. <coughs> okay. It, it seems to be a liturgical action. The person is laying, he's somehow he's approaching the altar with a gift, a doron that belongs to him. The word theosterion, altar, means the place where the sacrifice is made. And there, you remember. <laughs> I would like to believe that this refer well, we'll go, we'll go in a minute, that your brother has something against you. Now, this refers here to the Christian community where people are at odds with one another. Very rarely is there a congregation in which the members, there are not some, some members, have one thing against another. And in some of these congregations, which tend to be um, on the smaller side, on the smaller side, and that there are families that go back to the founding of the congregation, which can be 100 or 150 years, 150 years, there are animosities there. Notice, by the way, the member of the congregation is called an Adolphus, a brother. And the brother has a gripe against you. You are the one to do it. Now, what should you do? Lay your gift on the altar. And, 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 and there you remember. Could this possibly refer to some kind of service of confession and absolution? that before the Holy Communion was celebrated that, uh, in, the, in the early church, that these matters were handled. You know, a lot of these situations, uh, really, uh, when they first uh, happen, are not all that significant. But then, when they are not addressed, they then blossom into huge difficulties where people will not speak to one another. Now, Jesus here is not speaking about regulations in Herod's temple. Jesus does not like Herod's temple. Jesus does not like Jerusalem or the temple because the temple is where the enemies of God gather who are going to put him to death, and to crucify them. This is, where, this is where the high priests are. Jesus is not putting down liturgical rules for the temple. This happens to be regulations for Christian worship. And it, apparently it involves bringing some, we, we have offering and collection plates, you bring your gift up to the altar. And there you remembered. The word remember is significant. That's a significant thing that we are to look within ourselves to see what, what we have done, whether your brother, you are the one who is to make peace with your brother. You are. It doesn't say that he is. The, the responsibility is on every Christian to get matters settled and to do it right away and to do it before the Holy Communion is, is celebrated. And I love this passage, by the way, because it is so vividly, it's so vivid, it's so descriptive. Okay, it says, leave your gift. Here the word altar shows up. Altar is very significant because the altar is the place where Christ offers himself as a sacrifice. Go and look at this word right here. This is a good Lutheran word. Reconcile your brother be reconciled to your brother. By the way, one Christian, this is, this is going to come out in the gospel for next Sunday about loving your enemy. And what says love your enemy, 
It does not refer to people in the Christian congregation. It remembers that's a reference to people who are out, who are not Christians, who are outside of the church, who persecute the church. However, if we can love those who are outside the church, how much more can we love those people who are within the church? And then it says, this repeats everything which has already said before, uh, then you may continue with the church service. Go lay your gift at the altar. And um, this goes down to verse 25, does it? What, how far does this go? 37. 37. Well, let's move this up just a little. Okay, that's good. It says here, this is, the language here is very significant. And it's descriptive. At its face value, it seems to be describing a judicial process. Uh, not many of you, I'm sure none of you will. It says, make peace with your adversary while you, while you are on the road. Okay. You're the adversary. Somebody has something against you. Make peace with him on the road. Because if you don't, your adversary, ante dikos, the guy who finds you unjust, he will, par he will hand you over. That's the word that's used for Jesus being handed over on the night he was handed over. He, he will hand you over to the judge, the crite, and the judge will hand you over to the sheriff, and he will throw you into the prison. Now, I don't watch uh, that much uh, court scene television. I don't watch that much television. Um, but you watch the news, right? And out comes uh, the clerk of the, uh, the jury comes out. The clerk takes the verdict and gives it to the judge. And the judge gives the verdict and he says, guilty. And what happens then? The judge commands the bailiff, that's the term they use, to take the one who has been accused and to put him into the prison. This is a magnificently descriptive judicial process. Now, of course, this never happened in the church, just like this. But what Jesus is describing here is the final judgment. The judgment will be carried out. And... Uh, uh, I think we've all been involved in these kind of situations, not in major litigation where maybe uh, you've been in a, one car is bumped into another, and that uh, rather than uh, going to uh, getting this fixed by an insurance company or going to court to figure it out, it's easier to pay the $500 than, than going through all this uh, situation. I mean, we're all, in, we, I mean, that's the situation which we all know that it's better, to, it's better to make a deal than actually to take the chance of something worse happening to us. That's the language here, by the way. Make a, if your adversary, now the adversary happens to be, the adversary happens to be Satan, who's accusing us of sin. Uh, it, and it's also, because many times the Christians will be accused of things they are not guilty. But this refers to the absolute necessity of being reconciled in the, in the congregation because the, the consequences of not doing so are horrific. And then it says, uh, the, the, uh, the language here changes. It seems to suggest that there is some kind, that the person who is being taken to the prison is guilty of some kind of financial uh, some kind of financial crime because he says he has to pay he will not be let out I'm reading some great books very simple to read about uh, stories from in the city uh, from the state of New Hampshire uh, it gives you an idea of what life is like 
It gives you an idea of what the Bible was like. Because if you owed money and you didn't pay, you went to prison. Now, we could say that's barbaric, and we don't do that now because we have, we have uh, bankruptcy laws. But that's not the way it was. This is going to be, this is going to prepare us for the parable of Jesus of the unforgiving steward who, when he doesn't forgive, he is thrown into prison and he will pay the last party. Now, the reason for that is people tried to cover up their money uh, so they wouldn't have to pay their debts. We got something which, I don't know if you're going to use this in a sermon, we got the same thing happening now, and that is, Senior citizens will transfer much of their property to their children to avoid estate taxes. The similar, similar situation here, you're going you're to have to pay up. Uh, then it goes on to adultery. You shall not commit adultery. Now, what is striking here is that you know that the strong negative is not ooh, but may. You know that. Here, by the way, notice the way, this is not an imperative. But the idea is imperative. And where's the imperative? Because the one who is speaking is the absolute judge, Jesus Christ. I, I, I had a mother who was like that. She never threatened. She simply said, well, we're not going to do that. This is what we are going to do. And you know, know that in speaking in, with such authority, you know exactly how things were. Now, you probably had a mother or a grandmother who was just like that. And when, when, these, when, when the epistle of James handles the same materials, the word may is used. Abs and with the imperative, you will absolutely not do that. Jesus doesn't do that. It's not that he's more loving. That's not the point here. But that he's the one who speaks. And now when you get into the area of adultery, boy, do we have a big job here. And that is, how many children are born without the benefit of matrimony, about, are, are born without uh, parents who are legally married. And it's quite acceptable. I was a vicar in Wyoming when I was 21. I thought this was so unusual that you had multiple you had people getting married and all over the place, married to the same spouse and so forth. I thought that was so strange. It isn't strange now, friend. And every pastor has this particular problem in the congregation, and it certainly help, isn't helped by what appears on the Internet. If you want to address that problem, go right ahead and do it. Be careful of how you do it. I guess it has to be done. Because here, you got the word desire. Epithemia, epithemia. It's not just thinking the wrong thing. It's actually saying, that you want it. Now, <clears throat> he commits adultery. He already commits adultery with her in, in her heart. This is a different, different we've mentioned this before, that this is, going, this is a difficult gospel to preach on. However, if Jesus said it, you can blame him uh, on this particular situation. Here, by the way, a little lecture on sin doesn't hurt. Sin begins in the heart. And here I think our people understand this very well because at least in my conversations, and they're, they're quite frequent and they're, and they're relatively recent, people who are not in church actually are proud of the good lives that they are leading. They are actually so proud of their own holiness, their lives, and what they do. Well, they give, they give money away, they give it to their own children. They have clean slate. There's nothing better than persons being content with their own morality. Well, you can, uh, for a little counterbalance out to that, <coughs> uh, you can uh, look at this particular gospel. It's a difficult one. Can we just push this up just a little bit more?
So we can begin 29 and following. Good. Now, we've already done that. Now, this is a very difficult thing here. And by the way, you can always tell the difficulty of a passage if another evangelist does not copy it. So I think the evidence is this, that um, Luke was aware of Matthew, but when he came to certain sections which were so difficult, he just skipped over them. And by the, uh, or he puts it in another way. Uh, for this business of, ma of being reconciled with one another, Luke tells the story of a, of a, of a king who learns that another, that another army, another king is coming to attack him, and he goes out and he makes peace with him before, the, before entering a battle in which he's going to lose. That's the, that's the doctrine of reconciliation. The doctrine of reconciliation is embedded in that particular story. You must be reconciled whatever the cost, whatever the cost is to you. Now here, by the way, we do not, we have this unusual passage of amputations. If you're right and your left hand, or if your eyes, if they offend you, uh, take it out. Uh, because it says it would be better, is he better to lose, cut it out, cut it out, good surgical term, cut it out, and throw it, for it is a better thing for you than so that uh, one of your parts is destroyed and not that the whole and not that the whole body go away, come away into hell. Now every every pastor, every preacher is gonna have to decide for himself, how vivid he is he going to get? Going to get, and um, it's uh, it's true that uh, it's not unlikely uh, that you have members in your congregations who are diabetics, and in order to maintain their health and safety, uh, they've had to have uh, their foot. Generally, that happens. Something, uh, uh, maybe a toe, maybe the whole foot, leg have to be amputated because the argumentation is it is better the, to lose just one part of your body than for the gangrene to spread throughout it. Now, what's, now what is Jesus talking about here? There is absolutely no reference that anybody in the early church went around amputating. People amputated themselves in order to avoid sin. Also, the sin does not exist in the, in the eye or in the hand or in the foot. Sin exists within the soul. Now, what I think is a possible understanding of this passage is that this refers to removing people from the church, excommunication. Now, this is very rarely done and should only be done when there is no other solution. But this is the problem. If there is a person who is engaging in the notorious way of life and the situation is not addressed, it is very likely that other members of the congregation will find the same type of behavior acceptable and with the innate desire to sin that we all have, that they would also do it. Uh, the fly in the ointment. A little yeast destroys the, whole, uh, destroys the whole thing. You don't need it. And in a special way, this might refer to the pastors. If the pastor himself engages in what, ordinar what is considered ordinarily objectionable behavior, the people will see this as a license to engage in the same activity. So this is what it means when it says it is better, the, the hand, the foot, the various parts of the body, refer to members of the church. Now this is not, this is not mere speculation. 
because Paul in 1 Corinthians describes the church as a human body and uh, that we all have different parts to do. Now at the present time, I am sitting in the um, website room of Concordia Theological Seminary. And two persons, uh, uh, John Elmer and Jason Ewan, have been in this room, which is filled with all kinds of paraphernalia, which is beyond me. Now, I have nothing, I have no knowledge of how these things work. And if I, if, if I was the person uh, left in charge to handle this, I could not do it, period. I do not have the intelligence or the experience or the equipment to do it. The point is, is that the church consists of all kinds of people with one not more necessary or important than the other. It does happen when a person is a acting in such a way that uh, his behavior becomes notorious so that other people will do it. Certainly the younger people will find this to be the case. So. Um, Here's a case where Jesus says it's better to get rid of one member than the whole business will go into hell. He says right here, oh yes, now comes the real question. Can we go to the next one, please? 32, we, we're going down to 37. Okay, is 32 there? Oh, I see, thank you. Okay, we'll leave it like this. Here comes the prohibition against adultery. Uh, whoever, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Uh, 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 I'd rather handle the next section, but leave it up there, about taking oaths. And here's where the world has changed, and it's changed is the more difficult. I haven't been in charge. I haven't been in charge of a congregation for 50 years, and I was a pastor for five years. I never had to handle a case of divorce. Now the world has changed in a half a century, and I think the best possible thing we can do is is obviously it has to be contained in our uh, catechetical and confirmation classes, but I think it has to be preached on. And, uh, and this can be a pro. You can preach it from the divine sense here. It just happens that children who are brought up in intact homes just have a better chance in life. It kind of points to the original situation that God intended, a man and a wife and the children. That's going to be perfect. We know it's not perfect. We know the Old Testament. But the situation we have now, we are now... We don't have polygamy. We have successive polygamy. And that a person gets married to any number, a man will be a succession of wives, a woman will have a succession of, of husbands. And I think the pastor has to address this situation. And um, what about marrying a divorced woman? What about getting a man to... A man to and uh, here we get into the situation of compassion. Because in many cases, the members of our church, the spouse has left the husband or the wife. And what is the husband or the wife going to do? I, I, in handling this, I, I, the way I would, the easiest way for me to do this, which I won't do, is actually to uh, take a look at what I've written in the Sermon on the Mount. That might have been 20 years ago, 15 years ago. So you might want to look at it. It's not an easy situation to address. And uh, I think the first thing we have to do is simply to uh, inform our people, or at least before they get married, the young people or the old people, and that is uh, what is expected of them. And this is not simply a young people problem. Because people who have been married 20, 30, 40 years are getting divorced and getting remarried. 
those of you who are roughly in my age will remember that as kids, that there were the subject of divorce was taboo, and divorce itself was taboo. And uh, is, marriage is based upon, marriage is an institution. It's an institution created by God. It's not simply a way to express uh, uh, our emotions and our physical needs. Okay, and now comes the business of swearing. Now, we out, uh, if, you're, if, you're in the, if you're in the urban areas of Chicago and New York and so forth, or San Francisco, wherever you are, this might seem kind of strange, but out here we have Amish. And the Amish do not serve in the military. Oh, why? Because they don't take oath. Um, when it says here, do not swear an oath. Well, uh, does this mean that we are not uh, to, to participate in government activities. Uh, you know, we swear, we, uh, we do submit, take oaths all the time. That is, when you sign your income tax form, you're taking an oath. And that uh, if this inf information is not correct, you can be guilty of perjury. And now, uh, here the oath refers to this. The oath means that we take an oath that we are going to engage in a particular action that someone else is, uh, is going, uh, uh, that we are going to do over against somebody else. So you have it this, and I, or, uh, this, we can be absolutely uh, honest about this. I swear that I'm going to get that guy. You hear it all, you hear it all the time. Now you're not taking an oath on what's true. And you're not simply saying what you are going to do. You are saying that as, 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 as certain as there is a God, that you are going to take this particular action. And here we, I think we can refer to the epistle of James. And that is, if in regard to what you're going to do, simply say that yes and no, this is what you're going to do. And don't swear. Uh, and don't swear, and always say, if the, if the Lord wills. I swear I'm going to get into co that college no matter what. No, don't. Don't do that. Because it is, the reason why that's wrong is because God determines the future. Everything depends upon him. Now, why this seems to, this certainly appears to be authentic words of Jesus. Because he says, don't swear by the hairs of your head. Or don't swear by the temple. Now, the Jews were very clever, at least the adversaries of Jesus. They did not swear by God. They didn't call upon the name of God about what they were going to do. They swore upon other things. Uh, they swore about the temple. And uh, you've, heard it, you've heard it said that, um, um, I swear on my mother's grave, we'll n this is what we're going to do. All of that is forbidden. Why is it forbidden? Because the person who makes that kind of an oath puts himself, herself, in the place of God who alone determines uh, the future. And there's what Jesus says in verse 37 there. He says, I'll let your word be, um, just say yes, yes, and no, no. We don't need the expletives to make it the expletives. Uh, and by using the expletives, we're taking the place of God. For this section, friend, um, one, you're going to have more than enough to preach on. Two, you might just have to take one of these things out. And three, this is a very sensitive situation. So before embarking on this thing, by putting down absolutes, because before putting down absolutes, um, uh, be a little bit cautious, um, uh, so that we do so that we do not unnecessarily hurt or offend the feelings of the people. Because many of these people don't do it because the morality that is set forth here by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount certainly is not exchanged. And you know it, I know it, we all know it is not that. Well, I wish you the very best, and thank you very much, and wish you the best.